And now to a new segment we're calling Big Questions for Big Thinkers. And Ismail Saragaldin certainly fits the bill. He's published over 100 books and monographs and well over 500 papers on everything from biotechnology to the value of science. As well as his PhD from Harvard, he's received 40 honorary doctorates and many, many awards, such as the Order of the Rising Sun from the Emperor of Japan and presidential medals from Azerbaijan, Montenegro, Albania and Macedonia, and he's a Knight of the French Legion of Honour. Ismail was the founding director of the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, the new Library of Alexandria, and is currently the Emeritus Librarian. Ismail, welcome to Global Science. Thank you. It's a privilege to be with you. Look, there is so much that we could talk about, but I'd like to start with your personal statement of beliefs, if I may. You write that the world is my home, humanity is my family, nonviolence is my creed, peace, justice, equality and dignity for all is my purpose. Engagement, rationality, tolerance, dialogue, learning and understanding are my means. With outstretched hands, we welcome all those who share these beliefs. If your home is the world, it feels like a pretty unstable place at the moment. Are you confident that enough people do share your beliefs? There is, of course, always room for improvement. But if you take a historical perspective, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, just think of where the 20th century started. Um, colonization was standardized. Uh, uh, racism was everywhere fully entrenched. Uh, the uh, women did not have rights to participate uh, in any uh, political uh, activity in practically every country in the world. And uh, we gradually moved on uh, from that to the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, to recognition of the rights of uh, people to uh, uh, determine their own destinies. Uh, to the uh, rejection of colonialism uh, and at least the acceptance on an intellectual level of uh, equality and dignity for all. Uh, and by the end of the century, uh, we even had a convention on the rights of the child. So we made a lot of pre progress despite, of course, the enormous cost in the first half of the century by uh, everything from the First to the Second World War to the rise of Nazism, Communism, uh, Fascism, and so on. Uh, later on, we have our expectations, and for the first time, we got the whole world to agree, first on the Millennium Development Goals and then on the, on the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which taken together are an enormous statement of where we want to go. And so, yes, I do believe that uh, we have uh, made a lot of movement in that direction. Well, it's interesting when you do take that historical perspective, Ismail, you're right. It, it, I feel like, you know, we have made a lot of progress, but at the same time, when you talk about equality and dignity, and I look at what's happening, you know, in the United States in recent weeks and what's been happening in many parts of the world for a very long time, can't help but ask, you know, why are those concepts so difficult to guarantee? We have built our international system on what was uh, generally uh, called the Westphalian uh, peace. In 1648, the countries of the world uh, agreed more or less on a series of treaties that uh, if you were a government that controlled a territory and people on it and you could enforce your will there, you could enter into agreements with other such governments. And the nation state was born, or so they call it, the nation state. But what was really born was the sovereign state. And uh, that is fine. Now, the nation, you can talk about the Arab nation, and you find that in, uh, in 22 Arab countries that are members of the Arab League. You can talk about the German nation, which uh, includes uh, German-speaking people and uh, a shared cultural uh, literary heritage and so on. But the fact is that the sovereign states, almost all of them wanted to become nation states, and they used uh, the the uh, power of the state, uh, of the sovereign state, to enforce a common nationality uh, by having an official language, by having a flag, an anthem, a common historical narrative. And as a result, they immediately created uh, the issues of minorities in practically every society. 
And how they've dealt with that has been very difficult for almost all of them. Add to that that today the issue of immigration has also become a very important one, but that's also tied with the issue of minorities. But despite that, I would say that if you take the historical perspective, we are moving forward. There has been a great deal of advancement in this, and certainly we are not there. And if you want me to reverse all that's happening in front of you, it is to say that an act of injustice uh, that uh, was symbolic of a continued status of injustice towards minorities in the United States in this particular case triggered an enormous uproar, an enormous uproar of people saying this is unacceptable. And that in itself shows you that we have made some advances. Now, are these advances as rapid as I would have loved to see them? The answer is no. But are they there? Yes, they are. And uh, that we have among our uh, sustainable development goals, a very clear goal of reducing inequalities, of abolishing uh, hunger, of abolishing poverty. These are uh, designated, if you want, for both the dignity of the, of the human being and the recognition of the desirability of a modicum, a greater modicum of equality. I guess, you know, you're right. It has really rallied so many people around the world. And I'm curious, you know, what role can science play in working towards a more harmonious society? Well, science uh, really uh, has uh, a very major role to play. Uh, I mean, to me, to put it bluntly, uh, uh, every advance that has benefited humanity has come from science. Uh, we have a really uh, uh, magnificent uh, readiness to engage uh, with uh, the, the contrarian view. We listen to contrary uh, point of view and we arbitrate our disputes with evidence. So as a result uh, of that, we have a constant renewal and something which I call a constructive subversiveness. The fact that, that uh, uh, Einstein showed us that Newton was not absolutely right in what he had written, that these were approximations, does not diminish our respect for Newton. It adds our respect for Einstein. And we anticipate the next discovery that will overthrow the, the paradigm that we have uh, now built around the legacy of Einstein and of quantum physics, for example. Uh, why? Because if, if it, that didn't happen, we would have no more progress in science. But on the contrary, we are open to this constant uh, upheaval uh, and still maintain our respect to other because in science, the authority figure is not a book or a person. It is a method. We arbitrate our disputes with evidence and rational argument. Now, I think that sets the scientific community pretty much as a model uh, for a lot of the values that uh, I think are great and that uh, the ability of, uh, of science to constantly correct itself and find the errors in its own work and then recorrect it is uh, what is required. But for that to work well, we have to engage in something new and we are uh, myself and others are very, very involved in that, which is open science. What's your definition of open science? Open science is a movement whereby uh, all the elements related to a scientific uh, um, discovery, publication, etc., should be made available for anybody who wants to see it. Over the years, um, it has moved in a direction whereby uh, people publish the results, but you very seldom can find the actual background data that they used to arrive at those results. Uh, peer reviews usually reviewed methodology, but uh, increasingly people are looking, we want access to the data, we want access to the methodology, we want access to the peer reviews, we want access to a lot uh, of everything that made uh, this scientific uh, result available so that we can better test it 
and as a result ensure the greater integrity of, uh, of science as a whole. Now, in fact, you just have two major studies on, on uh, pandemic that have uh, been withdrawn, one from the Lancet and one or retracted. Why? Because of some questions about the data and they, they really want to see the data again. So open science maintains the idea that everything should be open for the benefit of humanity. It's not a matter of saying, you know, proving so-and-so is wrong or proving so-and-so is right. It is much more of the fact of saying, is this really the truth that we are seeking or an approximation of it that is getting us closer to the truth? And that's fundamentally what science is all about. Now, you're the Emeritus Librarian of Alexandria. The Great Library of Alexandria was one of the most significant libraries in the ancient world. Why was that? Well, it was without question the most significant library, uh, but it was not a library. <laughs> Alexander the Great, uh, who incidentally was tutored by uh, Aristotle personally, and he told Aristotle that uh, I'm not going to continue with you. And Aristotle said, why? And he said, because if I continued with you, I would be known as Aristotle's pupil and I want to be known as Alexander. So he told me, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to conquer the world. Now, for a young teenager, that's kind of a megalomaniac view, but okay, he did it. He did it <laughs> in 10 years. So he came to Egypt in what is now Alexandria, selected the site, and then went on to uh, hear his future from, uh, from an oracle in, uh, in Siwa Desert, the Oasis. And the oracle told him what he wanted to hear, that he was not a human being, he was not a man, he was a god which he kind of believed anyway. But that's another story. But he left and never came back again. And so the people who built that was his uh, uh, satrap in, or his, if you want, his uh, uh, general in Egypt uh, was named, known as Ptolemy. And uh, when Alexander died, he, uh, they divided the empire and that part, Egypt, and all the way up to uh, uh, Syria and uh, and. Uh, uh, Crete and uh, Cyprus were part of, and, and to Libya were part of the Ptolemaic Empire of Egypt. And uh, Alexandria would, would be the capital. And uh, so there was a guy called Demetrius of Phaleron who had ruled Athens uh, and who was now an advisor to Ptolemy. And he said to him, if you want Alexandria to be the greatest city in the world, you know, temples and marbles and gold are all right but you really need to bring the greatest minds in the world, in all fields. Bring them here and then give them nothing to do. Which was kind of a rather unusual idea, but hey, it's the idea we're still pursuing today. When the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, for example, says, uh, uh, Mr. Einstein, uh, please come to the Institute in Princeton and you can teach if you want, you can write if you want, you can do research or you can just sit and meditate. Just come, come and interact with the people who are here. So Egypt at the time could do this and they said, what are we going to do? So they created a temple to the muses and the temple to the muses uh, called the Museon in Greek, the museum in Latin, but museum not to the connotation we have today and they had the residential areas for all these people and they attached a botanical garden, a zoological garden, and what is very unusual for that time, uh, they also attached a dissection room and a library. And the library grew and grew and grew. So there was a second building of the library near the harbor and the third building of the daughter library elsewhere. So at least, uh, and the name of the library then came to cover the whole complex. The idea was so brilliant. There was an explosion of uh, scientific and literary and other output that came out of this uh, experiment. And it continued for 300 years until a most remarkable lady, of course, whom you know as Cleopatra. And, but then there's another that's another story. So what happened in the ancient library that set it apart from uh, uh, all other earlier libraries, Egyptian libraries worried about Egyptian knowledge. Greek libraries worried about Greek knowledge. The ancient library of Alexandria was the first time that universal knowledge, as far as they could know it, uh, was uh, combined in one place 
and where uh, translation occurred and where in fact they would stop ships and caravans, uh, confiscate their, their manuscripts, copy them and return the manuscripts to the people, but they uh, copied the scriptoriums and they translated it also. In fact, it was there that the Old Testament was first translated from Hebrew into Greek. So the ancient library grew and grew and grew and it had, we can estimate around 70% penetration of all the manuscripts that existed around that time until the Himalayas. Remember that Alexander did not go to China. So uh, in fact, he reached the Himalayas, to him the end of the world, and he said to have cried because there were no more worlds to conquer. Uh, young man, <laughs> did it all in 10 years on foot. On foot, you have to imagine these guys walked all of this uh, distance from Greece down to Egypt to the desert back again uh, and so on. So that it was universal knowledge. And there is a magnificent book that was written at the time. My, my biggest hero was the third director of the ancient library, the great Eratosthenes, who calculated the circumference of the earth with 98.5 accuracy, 98% uh, five accuracy, which is pretty remarkable considering it was done 2,300 years ago. And he, uh, he called uh, Kalimachus, who was the greatest poet of the Hellenistic period, uh, one of the great minds who was there, and he told him, look, I mean, poetry is something you can do in your spare time. Do something useful. Write the catalog for the library. And so uh, Kalimachus did. And this was the first time ever in history that universal knowledge was organized by subject and then by uh, author within subject, and the authors were ranked alphabetically by their names, which if you think about it, is still how we do bibliographies to this day. So Kalimachus became the, the inventor <laughs> of bibliography. Now that book, the Pinakes, uh, would be copied many, many times and find its way to the Suda of the Middle Ages. And it's thanks to that that we know how much we have lost. So thanks to, to the Pinacus, we know that the ancient library of Alexandria had 117 plays uh, by, uh, by Euripides, and of which 17 only uh, survive. Uh, so we know what we lost. It's like finding a list that says there was this guy, William Shakespeare, and uh, he wrote uh, something to gentlemen from Vernona and another thing called the Romeo and Juliet. But we understand he also wrote Hamlet and Macbeth and so on. And, but we don't know what these were. <laughs> we don't have them anymore. So it's because the Pinakes were, were available that we know how much we lost by the successive fires that would destroy the ancient library. In its place, though, you've created this incredible new library, the Library of Alexandria, or the BA, the Bibliotheca Alexandria. Um, tell me about that. Is it true that it holds the world's largest digital collection of historical manuscripts? Is that right? Yeah. At um, the, the uh, ancient library, of course, was built at a time when Egypt was the richest country in the world and they could afford not only to bring the great scientists, but also to pay a king's ransom to get uh, a library or to get books and to get some uh, resources. So when we rebuilt the library in this roughly the same place, uh, which allows me to say that uh, with a brief hiatus of 1600 years, we are open to, for business again, same place, same services. Uh, so it was a complex of uh, scientific research that we did at the library, the modern library. And so I started the modern library with a copy of the Internet Archive. And to my knowledge, still the only copy of the Internet Archive outside of San Francisco, where Brewster Kale had invented the Internet Archive. And I would argue with people that, look, uh, the Internet is the modern memory of humanity. And having a complete copy of the Internet in the Library of Alexandria allows me to say that, yes, I can start uh, already, uh, not necessarily with the with uh, all the volumes of the world, like the ancient library did, but in a digital version of a large part of that. 
And in fact, uh, we continued with that until 2009, and then we stopped because it was just getting too big for us. And we continued in the Library of Alexandria uh, in Egypt to uh, have the the record of the Arabic internet. So all the material in Arabic, we have been sending out robots that would photograph it every page on every website for four times a year. And uh, we've been maintaining that since then, but not the full uh, uh, internet. So, so that's how we started. But I also was able to uh, get donations to the library, uh, 500,000 volumes from France. Uh, I got 420,000 volumes from the Netherlands. Uh, I got, uh, uh, we purchased our own books. So when I left it, we had about 2 million uh, physical items. Uh, of course, enormous electronic resources. So I had like a, 1100 uh, uh, journals in paper and uh, 73,000 journals uh, uh, electronically. Uh, so uh, our resources uh, were significant and we worked closely with the Library of Congress, the British Library, the French Library, the Chinese Library, other libraries uh, in trying to maintain and advance accessibility in the world. In the same time, of course, it's also coincided with the enormous expansion of the role that Google played in uh, Google Books and getting about 20 million books, if not more, uh, by now uh, digitized. And uh, uh, this was a new world for libraries, and I can discuss more about that. But finally, it was a librarian's dream. I can arrange that in the most remote village anywhere in Africa, where you can have access to the internet, you can have access to almost all the world's knowledge. Today, young people going around with their, with, with their telephones can click on this and get access to almost anything. My friend Jimmy Wales invented one of the greatest inventions of all time, Wikipedia. And when people told him, are you really going to be able to get 100,000 people who don't know each other to collaborate on creating an encyclopedia? And he said, yes, and he did, and it works, and it's beautiful. And so we are in, 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 a, in a, right now in the midst of a big transformation, but a wonderful transformation for access to knowledge, for how people are going to transform that knowledge and work with it, and how, in fact, thanks to the work of pioneers like Bin Cerf and uh, uh, Bob Kahn and others, we can remain in touch with each other around the world and almost instantaneously communicating at the speed of light, we can spread ideas uh, uh, and discuss them among the global scientific community. You'd think that seemingly the internet and libraries would be something that would be conflictual because, you know, do we really need a library when we have the internet? But it's really interesting to you hear about how libraries are evolving so that actually they're working together and opening up people's access to information. I'm curious though, you know, there's a downside to this in that yes, we can share information so freely now, but that also includes misinformation. So kind of coming back to what we started talking about at the start of the show, you know, it does harm this sharing of false information. You know, is there an argument that it actually does more harm than good, you know, the internet and, and social media? Uh, not really. I, I mean, for me, the answer is very straightforward. Yes, uh, social media uh, has a dark side, but so did everything else. I mean, it's not uh, that uh, uh, there was no such a dark side. No, there was. There always was. Uh, there were people who were spreading uh, false rumors. There are people who were spreading gossip. There were people who were spreading lies. Uh, there were battles uh, for the hearts and minds of of generations of uh, people that has been going on all the time and uh, but uh, I have enormous confidence in science and I, and I put this uh, uh, down as a, as a um, uh, uh, an unimpeachable uh, 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 observation if you think back through the last 400 years or so 
more, 450 years, 500 years. There is no question that science was uh, minuscule, uh, especially in Europe, if you think of that. Uh, and there's a famous painting of Galileo uh, putting his hand on his work and recanting his work and all the bishops of the Inquisition who were forcing him to do that. They had burnt uh, Giordano Bruno at the stake and, and he may or may not uh, uh, escape. He escaped and spent the last eight years of his life in, in a villa outside of, uh, of Rome. There's no, of course, denying the enormous power that those people had in that society if they could bring people like Galileo and have him recant. But who today remembers any of those people? I defy people when I show them this painting and I say, okay, tell me who these people are. The people who are passing judgment on Galileo and forcing him to recant. Nobody can even remember one of them. They are insignificant, they've been lost. Why? Because ultimately science proves itself. It has a method, it's, uh, it's what is uh, proved once and twice and again and again and truth will out, truth will always uh, win out. And the experimental method is enormously powerful. And then uh, you think of uh, other debates, the big debates, for example, around Darwinian uh, theory of evolution. Well, it's still going on till today, but uh, uh, the opponents of uh, the theory of evolution are smaller and smaller uh, and those who believe in the mounting evidence uh, uh, are more and more. Yes, uh, we, we take things for granted. It is surprising how quickly people take things for granted. Uh, we seldom sit and sort of, I mean, I, I used to take planes like, uh, you know, taking a bus, um, uh, fly to this conference and that lecture here and this and that. Uh, I don't sit in and say, wow, my God, do you imagine this is actually a heavier than air machine and it's going to fly and take me almost at the speed of sound. Then you just take it for granted. You say, oh, let's get on here and read and do whatever I'm going to do in the plane. My grandchildren have grown up completely with the mobile phones. Uh, in fact, I was talking to one of them. I said, would you like to have a watch? And he says, what for? I said, what do you mean, what for? Don't you want to know what time it is? He says, I know what time it is in my phone. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's part of a of a, 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 a generation that was totally brought up with uh, with uh, mobile phones and the the we used to think I mean uh, how wonderful computers were but computers when I started with them in '65 it was the IBM 360 which took almost an entire floor of uh, Harvard's building uh, one of the Harvard buildings but. But uh, nowadays, it's the, not, not the PC, which we thought was a revolution. It is a successive revolution, which is the handheld device and the cloud. And all of these transformations have impact on the behaviors of people. And so what is changing and evolving fairly rapidly uh, are, are these behaviors, including how we meet other people. Uh, you know, we used to meet uh, uh, other people in clubs and in uh, uh, social occasions, well, now they meet online. And so there's a lot of these transformations that are going to take place. And so when people say in the, we're going to return to normal after our current uh, lockdown, uh, yes, but the normal will not be the same normal that we left behind. But that's all right. That's how we advance as humanity. And hopefully, as a result of all of this, we will again revive the values that I consider so important and that I have put in my credo, the values that we are all a single human family. So let us all work together. I love your sentiments. It really replaces fear of what's coming with hope and, and, and optimism. Ismail, honestly, it's like you are a human library. There is so much more that we could talk about. It has been absolutely entertaining, informative. Thank you so much for your time. You are most welcome. And that's our show. 
You can stay up to date by following us on Facebook and Twitter. We post full episodes of our show on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe by searching for Global Science Television. I'm Nula Hafner. See you next time. Remember to hit subscribe for our regular videos. And while you're here, check out our past episodes. 